The expression is said to have been coined by the English politician John Bright in 1859. He was dissatisfied with the campaign of Lord Elko. And so he claimed that Lord Elko was flogging a dead horse. Flogging a dead horse is an English phrase that, well, you, can, you know what it means, is a futile effort, wasted time, wasted strength. Like beating a dead horse is going to make it up, get up and go back to work again. It's talking about futile efforts. And the message today, as I was putting this together and preparing it a couple of weeks ago, is uh, it kind of felt like this to me, beating a dead horse. We've almost made it a national pastime, griping about the government, uh, complaining about the depravity in our society and what's going on in our culture. Of course, this has always provided a lot of material for preachers. They roll up their sleeves and rail against wickedness. And we see this in every generation. I have a book in the, my office that is a book of sermons from the mid-1800s. And uh, I think it's hilarious that one of the messages in there, the man is preaching again. I mean, he's got his r sleeves rolled back and he is preaching against long dresses on women. When's the last time you heard a message against long dresses on women? Uh, then, of course, that was the style, that, you know, longer than what they needed to be. And he was just talking about the culture of that day. And today, uh, you know, women uh, dress differently. Not enough, not enough uh, clothes to uh, clog a double blur shotgun sometimes. But uh, so we preach differently. Different cultures are different ways. Uh, but culture has always created material for pastors to preach. And, and as they should uh, preach against the wickedness of the day. But one of the mistakes that we make, and this is an easy thing for us to do as Christian, is shift all the blame to an easy target. I heard a story about a little boy who wanted $100, and he prayed uh, for weeks and weeks. He was praying for $100 so he could buy a bike and, and uh, just wasn't getting any funds, and so he decided finally to take, put some feet to his prayers, and he decided to write a letter to God. And he wrote a letter to God asking for $100 so he can buy his bike, and he put it in the mail, addressed to God, USA. Well, the post office received it. What do you do with a letter addressed to God, USA? And they forwarded it to the White House. They didn't know what else to do. And so the White House received it, and the letter trickled all the way up to the president. And he thought it was su such a cute thing the kid did, and so he told his secretary, why don't you send that boy a $5 bill? Well, the boy was understandably very delighted when he received a letter with the White House stationery, and inside was a $5 bill. And uh, he was excited about it, and he wrote God a thank you note. And this is what he wrote. Dear God, thank you very much for sending the money. However, you sent it through Washington, D.C., and those jerks took $95 in taxes. The government is an easy target, wouldn't you agree? I agree with Ronald Reagan, government is not the solution to the problem, government is the problem. Uh, he said the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Remember that when he said, I believe it was on uh, one of the night shows he did. These are, yeah, and yes, the government is responsible for many of our ills and they are not the solution to the problem. But this morning I want to remind you of that solution. Uh, we recognize the problem. That's easy. We also must recognize the solution. That's not so easy. This morning, the message I want to bring to you is problems and the solution. Problems and the solution. Let's read, if we will. I guess probably I should open my Bible as well. You think it might be a good idea? To read that there. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 20 is where we're going to start. And the Lord is talking to Abram here. The Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come up unto me, and if not, I will know. The men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abram stood yet before the Lord. And Abram drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? For adventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not <clears throat> spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein, that be far from thee to do after this matter, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should not should be as the wicked, that 
be far from thee? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Ooh, that's a, that's a pretty brazen thing to say to the Lord, isn't it? The Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abram said unto them, uh, said, answered and said, Behold, now I've taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there'll be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there but shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be found twenty there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Have you ever considered or un- just, just thought about the fact that here he is dickering and dealing with the Lord God of Almighty himself? And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way, and as soon as he had left commuting with Abraham, Abraham returned unto his place. The problems and the solution. Father, I pray you'd help us today as we try to put some perspective on this passage here and what your word has to say about our place in this nation. May we, Lord, bring honor to you in all that we say and do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He said in verse 21, I will go now and see whether they have done all together uh, according to the cry of it which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. I like this verse because it shows us the Lord is not rash. He is not... Uh, uh, he, he does not lose his temper. But there does come a point where God must judge or he is not just. So God announces what he is going to do uh, with Sodom. Their sins were so offensive that the stench of it had risen to heaven itself. And then we read that Abraham stood yet before the Lord thinking of Lot down in Sodom. He stood as it were between the living and the dead. Abraham, like Christ, all of a sudden became a mediator between God and and man. This is important because what we call this <coughs> scene here is a Christophany in the Old Testament. It's a place where Jesus Christ shows himself uh, to man. Who is it that's visiting here? In verse number one, it says that the Lord came. God, I believe, in the person of Jesus Christ visited Abraham. Lord comes from the original word Jehovah in this text. And we know that the Jehovah in the Old Testament is the Jesus in the New Testament. And so, by the way, Isaiah 43, 11, uh, tells us this when he says, I, even I am the Lord. He says, Jehovah there again. And beside me is there no Savior. But what must have filled the Lord's heart there? For he, the second person of the Godhead, is watching Abraham do for Lot what he will one day do for all mankind, and that is be our mediator. He is the mediator between God and man, uh, sec, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And so Abraham begins here to bargain with God. What would God take? How many souls would be needed to save Sodom? It was done with great daring, but it was also done with great dignity as we read through that. And he asked, Lord, suppose there are 50 righteous and suppose they lack five of that and there will only be 45. And then he went down to 40 and then down to 30 and then to 20 and then to 10. Each time... Uh, God came down to Abraham's request. I find that fascinating that we can have our prayers honored. This is called an intercessory prayer. Did you know that God will honor your intercessory prayers for others? That's a blessing. And so he stopped at 10 though, Abraham did, but why 10? Well, probably because Abraham believed there would be 10 righteous people in Sodom. And if we break it down, we can see why. Lot and his wife and his two unmarried daughters were still in living in the home. That was four right there. And then it talks about his sons-in-law using plural. And so he had two sons-in-law. Add that to two wives. This makes another four. That brings us up to eight. And then in chapter 19, verse 12, it talks about his sons, plural. That gives us two more at least. That brings us up to ten. So probably Abraham thought that at least his family ought to be saved, righteous, doing right. And that's only if Lot never handed out one gospel tract. That's if Lot never told one person about Jesus Christ. That's why Lot never tried to win anybody to the Lord. But what I want to take from this story 
is that deterred judgment, don't miss this in the story here, deterred judgment was not dependent on the wicked, deterred judgment was dependent on the righteous. The ones that were God's people. Remember Nineveh? Remember Nineveh and the message that came to them? 40 days and you're going to be destroyed. Want to wipe it out? And boy, Jonah loved giving that message too. He was excited to give them uh, the message of destruction. But probably there were no righteous people in that city. Here there were. And whether or not judgment fell on the city of Sodom was not dependent on the thousands of wicked within that city, but whether or not the righteous were doing what was right. Here, whether or not judgment would fall depended on God's people. Just ten righteous people would spare Sodom from destruction. The most valuable person in any city, state, or nation are Christians. The most valuable people in America are God's people. They may be mocked, they may be obscure, they may have little or no worldly recognition, but they are the most valuable of all citizens because we, they, are the ones who prevent destruction. I believe with all my heart that that's one of the only reasons America hasn't been destroyed already, is that there's God's people within it who are praying for her. I re- <clears throat> the world honors the ungodly, but it is, it is the godly who should be honored. We truly are the ones that cause or prevent judgment on this nation. And I love America. I, I've been fortunate enough to see some of its beauty. Of my own eyes, I've seen Death Valley, the Grand Canyon, the hills of Tennessee, the backwoods of Kentucky, the wilds of North Carolina, the red clay of Georgia, the beauty of northern Michigan, and now the wide open nothing of South Dakota. I love it all. Lakes, oceans, mountains. I love the national anthem. I still get chills when we sing it, even this morning as we sang it together. What a blessing it is to hear that national anthem. I love our flag. I love what it stands for. The red symbolizing hardiness and valor. The white symbolizing purity and innocence. The blue representing vigilance, perseverance, and justice. I love the fact that our money still has on it in God we trust. That's an amazing thing right there. Think about it. The Bible says you cannot serve God and money at the same time. And so we put right on our money in God we trust. So every time you spend a dollar, it's a reminder saying, hey, hey, you don't trust in this, you trust in God Almighty. That's a blessing to be able to see that. I love our history. How our forefathers brought forth on this nation, uh, brought forth a nation conceived in liberty. You cannot look at our history without seeing the hand of God all over it. I love the fact that the men who fathered this country held the Bible in high esteem. But I must confess to you, every time that I put together a patriotic message or we're celebrating a patriotic theme, (coughs) I get pretty frustrated. I don't understand how we can live in a nation where young people do not respect our flag. A Black Lives Matter chapter in Utah has called the American flag a symbol of hatred used only by racists. Lawrence R. Samuel of Psychology Today said it can be understood how the flag can be seen as a representative of white and male power. A respondent to a Salt Lake Tribune survey asked people if they fly the American flag. This person said, I fly the flag of any nation that is brave enough to resist the U.S., And so I fly the flags of Bolivia, Cuba, Vietnam, Palestine, and many others. Numerous churches here in Brookings itself, one of which I hold in pretty high regard, has banned the flag. Can't have the flag in the church anymore. For the record, friend, for me, uh, the American flag represents the unity of the American people and the shared hope that we as a nation can live up to its highest ideals. At the top of that list is the proposition that all men are created equal and uh, endowed by their creator with inalienable rights that among them is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It saddens me that to see that the American flag has become partisan and divisive. The flag that so many people fight for. The United States Supreme Court has held that the government cannot prohibit a citizen from desecrating this great flag 
but it does not take away the vileness of that act just because it might be legal. I cannot imagine the grief of a veteran who has seen his friends give their life and limb for this flag to watch somebody desecrate it and the pain that must take a place in his heart and his life. And by the way, my hat is off to them and I salute every one of our veterans and the flag that they fought for. Our beloved country stands above all other nations. Its influence is felt everywhere. Her flag, our flag, is the only flag that is commonly recognized worldwide. I dare say, and I might be wrong, but I dare say that there are not five people in here that could draw and color the Russian flag from memory. But everybody in the world knows that good old red, white, and blue, no matter where you're from. I don't understand why people uh, do not put their heart over their, uh, or the hand over their heart when the anthem is played. I don't understand uh, the notion that you actually get rewarded in this country and lauded for burning this flag. It saddens me that many of our leaders even want to remove the under God from the pledge. I believe America is the greatest nation in the world and it pains me to see people shy from that belief. One of our recent presidents made this statement. And I quote, one of the great strengths of the United States is, though we have a large Christian population, we do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. Mr. President, with all due respect, that's how we were founded. When did we give it up? Because I don't remember that we ever rescinded that title. Amen? Let me give you some of the, uh, what a few of our founders had to say. James Madison, he was the fourth United States president. He said, cursed be all learning that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Patrick Henry, a ratifier of the United States Constitution, he's the one that gave that famous speech, give me liberty or give me death. He said it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. George Washington said it is impossible to rightly govern the, God, govern the world without God and the Bible. John Adams said July 4th ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. Our, our nation was founded on the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Other nations long to be like us, uh, while many in our midst despise what we are. Like China and Russia and many others, we've had to build a wall and a fence. Uh, but we're not building a fence to keep people in like many other countries are. We have to build a fence to keep people out because everyone knows how remarkable our nation is. God is all over the founding of our nation. It wasn't so long ago that on Sunday the most important thing was church. It wasn't so long ago that on Sunday businesses closed and families would find themselves in the house of God. Now by the hundreds and the thousands, if they're not working, they're gathering at sporting events in parks. I like NASCAR. I don't know if anybody else likes NASCAR, but I like NASCAR. My dad makes endless fun of the sport. How a person would get in and drive in circles, and drive hundreds of miles and get out where he started. He always has a hard time with that. But uh, for about 10 years working in the auto parts business, uh, I was offered, every, every year I was offered NASCAR tickets. And I'd have loved to go, but I never did go to a, an actual NASCAR race because it was always held on a Sunday. I don't want my children to look at me and see something that takes precedence over the house of God. I don't want to uh, show them those priorities. The America you may remember as a child made God an important part of its culture. Today, judges are fired for having the Ten Commandments in public. Same-sex marriage is promoted, making a mockery of marriage, which is God's first institution. We're living in a society today where wokeism is more adhered to than the Ten Commandments. Righteousness is called bigotry. Patriotism is called narcissism. Godly male leadership is called toxic masculinity. The nuclear family is called old-fashioned and outdated. In fact, a, an activist feminist, Linda Gordon, said this, the nuclear family must be destroyed. The breakup of families now is our primary objective. And that is the primary objective of the world today. I feel bad for parents today. You have to be able to explain not only the birds and the bees, 
but the bees and the bees and the birds and the birds and the birds that used to be bees and the bees that used to be birds and the birds that look like bees. You have to explain all those things to our children today. Clearly, we have problems. So what is the answer? When the planes hit the towers on September 11th, uh, as one, if you remember that day, as one, this nation cried out to God. Officials who previously scoffed God and Christianity. You remember that? They all sang, God bless America in our nation's capital. But do you remember this day not long afterward in August 27, 2003? That was the day the monument to the Ten Commandments was removed from the Alabama State Judicial Building. And that gives us a window in the thinking of America today. The Bible says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. But America wants to declare the love, but it does not want the commandments. We want to talk about how we love God, but we don't want to do what He says. In other words, we will want the blessing of God, but not the responsibility that comes along with it. And God tells us you can't have it both ways. If you love me, keep my commandments. Today in America, about 65% of adults identify themselves as Christian. That's unfortunately down 10% from just five years ago. 30% of the world's population identifies themselves as a Christian. Yet our actions do not mirror our, identif our identification. Television has sunk to new lows, and it continues to do so. Uh, from sitcoms to reality shows to commercials to Super Bowl halftime shows. Filth is paraded in front of our children and our families, polluting our minds whenever we let it in. Our heroes are sports icons that you wouldn't let within a mile of your kid because of what their life represents, personally. And uh, so Jesus has been kicked out of schools, even though Chatham Middle School in Chatham, Missouri, uh, New Jersey, teaches Islam i got news for those Cracker Jacks. Our country wasn't founded by a bunch of Muslims. It was founded by Christians. Bible-believing Christians. Mayflower, the Mayflower came over here in the name of Jesus Christ, not on the name of any other religious leader. It saddens me as I walk the halls of a public high school just recently and I'm looking around and I see pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. I see pictures of Malcolm X and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. I saw no sign of George Washington and Patrick Henry and Abraham Lincoln and Benjamin Franklin or any of our early founders. We're selling our children a pack of lies, not telling them the truth of this great nation, the true history. Spotted owls are more valuable than 4,000 babies that die every day in this country. Bald eagle eggs are protected under federal law. A single egg, you did mess with that, will give you a $5,000 fine and a year in jail. But there's no federal law protecting children from abortion. Now, camp was coming last week, so I had to work ahead. Even pastors work ahead sometimes. Uh, and I wanted to have everything ready for this Sunday, so... Uh, this message, I put everything together and got it ready uh, two weeks ago. Since then, since I wrote those lines, something has happened. Praise the Lord. What a blessing that life has won a victory in our nation. And uh, what a blessing that we see that happening. That's a great step. More than 22,000 logging jobs have vanished in a battle to save the spotted owl in the Northwest. I, I thought when I read that I'd give uh, Larry and Stephen Graham a shotgun, they could take care of the spotted owl problem. We could get everybody back to work. Amen. No, that's not politically correct, but I'm not running for anything, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm just saying there's something wrong with this nation that values a bunch of animals over human life. For we value money over morals. With that in mind, I want to remind you of a familiar verse. You can turn there if you'd like. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Please don't tune me out. We hear this verse so frequently that it sometimes just becomes so much white noise. And I don't want you to be tempted to do that today. Because today I want to not only rail out against our problems. We have problems, that's the easy part. But we have to look at the solution. And so I found last week a picture of the person responsible for fixing the problems in this nation. I found it on Amazon. You can find anything on Amazon. Do you know that? And I found a picture here of the person responsible for fixing the problems in America today. 
I thought I'd show you this today. Uh, this picture, it's something you can find as well. I'm going to set it up here so you can come up and maybe get a good look at it later. It's a it's quite a handsome, dashing fellow too, if I can say it myself. I'll set that picture there just as a reminder. That's who's responsible for fixing this nation. Get a good look at it. Listen to the words of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Oh, here's the hard part. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In light of this verse, let us be careful about criticizing our nation in its current state. Can I remind you, we are America. If America is going to be pure, decent, honest, honorable, and holy, we must be pure, decent, honest, honorable, and holy. America is only as pure as the people in it are. America is only as pure as you and I are. Can I just stop and say that we as Christians are really good at this stuff. We're really good at whining and complaining about all the problems and wickedness around us. Well, can I remind you today, I want to talk about solution, not just problems. And the title, that's what we entitle it, Problems and Solution. I like solutions, amen? One of the things I've instructed our, uh, our staff when they first came on is that, you know, don't only bring problems, bring a suggested solution for the problem. That would help sometimes. Uh, a nation is only as holy and decent as the Christians who live in that nation. We gripe and complain about all the filth on television. Have you turned it off? We complain about social media. How much time do you spend on social media? We resent the propaganda that CNN puts out. When's the last time you put out the gospel? It's, we think it's awful they took the Bible out of school. How much do you read every day in that book? We think it's terrible that they take down the Ten Commandments. Do you live them? A businessman whose fortune had been made by a the pain of others. He told Mark Twain years ago, he told him piously, I want to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. He said, I'm going to go up on top of Mount Sinai and I'm going to read aloud the Ten Commandments. Mark Twain answered him and said, I have a better idea. Why don't you stay right here at home in Boston and just start keeping them? It's a good thing, isn't it? We hate it that the LGBT pushes their agenda. When's the last time you pushed the gospel track? We agree that people ought to go back to church. People ought to make church a priority. Where are you on Wednesday night? Oh, pastor done gone to meddling now, hasn't he? That's painful. Well, I'll pick on me, okay? Let me uh, make, give you an example here. Not long ago, I was talking to somebody about the fact that they're taking cursive out of teaching in public school. You, you know that they, they don't teach cursive anymore in most public schools. And I'm agreeing with them. This is, you know... Uh, that's all we need as a reminder. They're dumbing our kids down. And that's another problem we have with the American education system. But I print. I don't... I've never gotten a card from me or any you know, I print. I can write cursive. It's a lot slower. It shouldn't be. It's meant to be faster. But I, I just I don't do it so often. So it's I can and I can read cursive. It's... It uh, takes me a little longer to work through it sometimes, but I know cursive, but I don't write cursive. And so if I'm sitting and talking to somebody about uh, dumbing down of the American education system, taking out cursive, and, and I print, you know what that makes me? Big old fat hypocrite, amen? Now that's just an illustration, but how can we expect a godless society to do right when we don't as God's people? So when God looks down at a broken nation, and he agrees there's something wrong with that nation, and he writes out a prescription to fix that nation. He starts out with the words, if my people, which are called by my name. It's interesting. The hope of America is not in the White House. It's not in the Congress. It's not in the Senate. It's not in a balanced budget. 
It's not in Biden. It's not in Jezebel. Sorry, Hillary. It's not in Obama. It's not in Pelosi. And it's not in Trump. Okay? The answer of God, uh, to a broken country is not in any of those. I think they named it well when they called it politics. Poly is a Latin word meaning many. And ticks is a word that means blood-sucking creatures. Many blood-sucking creatures. I think that's a good term for politics. The answer is not in politics. It's in God's people bending their knee. Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. Ronald Reagan said, When America's military strength, while it is important, let me add here, and I've always maintained that the struggle now going on for the world will not be decided by military might. The real crisis that we face today is a spiritual one. End quote. He knew the hope of America is in a place called church and in a people called God's people. We have no one to blame but ourselves. We say that we love this country. What are we doing about it? If my people, which are called by my name, love the fact that God is talking to Abraham and they don't even discuss the wickedness that's going on. You know, what about, Lord, if we can go into Sodom and begin a campaign and elect a godly mayor? How will that do? Wasn't discussed. Politics wasn't used. It was just righteous people that determined whether or not judgment would come. That's instructive, isn't it? That's instructive. The answer is not in institutions. The answer is you and I. John Stuart Mill said this, and I quote, Let not any pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to achieve their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. The truth is, there comes a time we've got to stop talking and actually do something. The answer is not in institutions. It is in you and I. You might say, somebody in here today might say, oh, but preacher, I do my part. I post on social media. Being famous on social media is like being rich in Monopoly. Being popular on social media is like being at the cool table in a mental hospital. I mean, it doesn't really mean that much. Now, I'm grateful. We do have some folks in our church even that put up Bible verses. That's a good thing. If you've got social media and put up Bible verses, I'm not knocking that at all. That's a good thing. But don't, don't let that replace all of our other responsibilities. Amen? Social media is not the answer to the world's ills. Let me get real close and personal here. When's the last time you come to an altar and bent your knee and prayed for this nation? We say we love America. When's the last time you prayed for her? When's the last time you've lain awake at night, fell on your face for this nation? When's the last time you've prayed for our president? Whether we like him or not, we need to pray for him, amen? We need to pray for him. That's a hard thing to do sometimes, but we need to do so. Every revival in history has been preceded by prayer. When it, what's it going to take to save this nation? It's going to take the prayer and sacrifice of God's people. When the wicked king uh, ordered Balaam to come and curse Israel, and uh, you remember that Balak sent for the prophet Balaam and said, I want you to curse <coughs> the Israelites. And, and uh, Balaam tried several times because there was a lot of money involved in it, and, and he found he could not curse God's people. He learned <coughs> th this principle that you cannot attack from the outside and destroy, or very rarely can you. Then he told the king, tell you how to get Israel. God's not letting me curse them, so I'll just give you some advice. Get and start mixing worldly women in with the men. Mix worldly men in with the women. Start mixing in some worldliness and they'll destroy themselves before you know it. And that's exactly what happened. They let uh, what they could not do from the outside, they did to themselves from the inside. He, uh, mixing worldliness in with God's people. It is about time that some of us decide that America is worth our time and sacrifice. God wants you to live your life uh, as a living sacrifice to Him. And that will make the difference. Every man and woman in here should be ready to say, Here I am. I will influence someone for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to make the difference in our nation. I heard about two men who are at the beach and one of them is... Uh, sunning himself on a chair right beside the water, and one of them is in the water. And the fellow that's in the water, without realizing it, falls into a hole. There's a, 
there's a sharp drop off and he falls down and he no longer can touch the ground with his feet. Now uh, he can't swim. And so now he's bobbing up and down. He's sputtering and he's yelling for help. And he's calling for his uh, friend that's just a few feet away and saying, help, help, I can't swim. The man on the beach is watching him and says, I can't swim either, but you don't see me making a fuss about it. And I think that's us on the beach. We, we know there's problems, but it's not really affected me yet. I'm in South Dakota, praise God. I'm still free. It hadn't affected me. And so we don't think we have to get involved. Can I tell you that sooner or later, uh, we're on the beach, we're fine, but sooner or later, we're going to be drowning too. And it's time that we stand up today for the nation that we love. What about your children? What are we doing to set them up? The next 50 years, according to studies that I've read, we're going to see a, quite a shift uh, in diversity within the religious community. 50 years ago, America's landscape was dominated by Bible-believing Christians and Catholics. Now there are currently more Muslims in America than American Jews, Episcopalians, and Presbyterians put together. A few years ago, the uh, post office, which traditionally uses Hanukkah or Christmas stamp, issued a stamp uh, honoring Ramadan. Historically, about 5% of people identified with no religion at all. We call them the nothings. Today, the nothings number 30%. My, what a sacrifice our forefathers paid for this country. Let us not squander it. And the way we don't squander it is we live the way we ought to live. We live godly. We live righteously. Now, all that's said this morning, I can tell you I'm still an optimist concerning America. I believe God can save her, but He can't do it and He won't do it without His people. There's the person responsible right there. You ought to come up and get a good look at him or her. It, it, he identifies differently depending on who's looking at him, okay? Uh, but pray that God take away, some of you got that, so we moved over. Pray that God take away our complacency. Let's do our part. Look, America's in trouble, there's no denying that. The question is not what someone else will do. I'm asking you this morning, what will you do? Do you think it might make a difference? We've got about 100 people in here this morning. Do you think it might make a difference if 100 people in Brookings, South Dakota this morning committed that for the next month or the next year, I'm going to spend five minutes a day praying for this country. I think that might make a difference. I believe it would. If you read through the uh, annals of history and how this country was started and reading about the Revolutionary War, and, and I'm sure you probably read the story about George Washington's coat that took off one time, was full of holes, he'd never been hit, and had no idea how this could happen, and, and all the miracles that took place in the founding of this nation, we see God's hand all over it. Don't you think that was as a result of prayer? God's people begging God to do something? Uh, the, a, a, a ragtag revolutionary army taking on the greatest military fighting unit in the world and winning? God's all over that. And He still wants to bless today. We need to do our part. And we need to be the right people and let God use that to save this nation. Are you willing to do what it says in our text? If my people, which are called by my name, shall fill themselves and pray and seek to turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I heal their land. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. The invitation is very clear today, friend. Are you living a life that would honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you prayed for this nation? Do you mean you make a commitment today? Hey, I'm going to do my part. I want to do my part as a citizen of this country. One of the greatest things you can do <coughs> is beg God for it. Pray. Live the life you, you can live. Live godly. Try to reach somebody for Jesus Christ. Make a difference. Do that way. That'll be a blessing. As she begins to play, would you stand along with me and I'll have every head bowed, every eye closed still. If God spoke.